الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين This is the first session of three sessions where we condensely pass through the masail and the rites manasik of hajj if you look at the islamic jurisprudence that embraces taharat beginning with taharat this is the very first chapter how to clean yourself how to do wudu and ghusl right to the end to the last chapter of the islamic jurisprudence passing through prayers, fasting, uh, zakat, hajj, and others, you would find that hajj occupies the major chunk of the Islamic jurisprudence. So the masail, the questions, and the articles of hajj in these law books, Islamic law books, is bigger, bigger than the masail of fasting and prayers and zakat and others. We try to summarize that for you. I don't intend to complicate things, especially for those who are going for the first time. I, I, my task is to make it easy for you, emotionally, psychologically, easy so you can understand Hajj and you don't get nervous. And this begins right here today when we are introduced to Hajj. Therefore, I'm going to make it step by step and very easy. And not only I'm going to mention the Masail, but also my own experience for the last 30 years in Hajj. Because experience counts, really. It really counts. Sometimes you study Hajj in a book, just like studying swimming and driving in a book. But when you start swimming or driving, it's something else. So you have to go to Hajj to be able to understand the meaning of Hajj and the things that we are going to do. We are going to put things here on the board. But when you go there, you're going to see the hidden side of it. That is, I cannot illustrate that here on the board. But I am going to speak about it, inshallah, and make it easy for you. In three sessions, rather than having 30 sessions, some imams and mashayikh, they do 30 sessions, I know them. I make it three sessions, condensed. And then of course, inshallah, when we go to Medina and Mecca, we're going to have a daily session, sometimes twice a day, to elaborate and explain the things that are going to do the same day or the following day. Because if I tell you the whole story, you're going to be lost. You cannot memorize them. We tell you the story bit by bit. First of all, my friends, what is Hajj? It's important to understand what we are doing. Hajj is a different trip. We make many trips, domestic, international. We go to places here on earth for vacation, for studying, for learning, for maybe treatment sometimes, for business. But Hajj is completely different. Hajj is a business with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Two people, two sides are dealing with each other. One is you and the other is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the other end is the one who invited you, not the group leader. The group leader is a catalyst who facilitates the trip for you. I am here as someone who explains the Hajj for you, but I am not the one who is going to reward you. I am not the one who is going to tell you that your Hajj is accepted or rejected. This is not my business. This is the business of the one who is inviting us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are his guests. And this journey is to him. This journey is journey to Allah. So, whatever difficulty, inshallah, he would not find any difficulty, no problems. 
Hajj today is much, much more easier than the Hajj 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Hajj today compared to the Hajj 5 years ago or even 10 years ago is a very easy vacation. So, but any step you take is counted and observed by Allah. It's not neglected. Any step, any penny you pay, any hour you spend, any day you spend, any movement is all recorded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And He's going to reward you for that. It's not going to go unnoticed. He notices everything from the day you come, from the day you register, you call and you say, I'm interested to go to Hajj. Have you seen some attorneys? They charge you for the phone call. Even if you at, call him with all due respect to the attorneys. Even five minutes call, he will, when he sends you the bill, he says five minutes call. This much. Allah does the same. He will give you, reward you. For every minute you spend on this journey, you are rewarded for that. It is not wasted. It is not wasted. We go there, my friends, to seek forgiveness. This is number one goal of Hajj. We have done many mistakes and many sins in our life. Many, many, many. Countless. Countless violations against ourselves, others, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What do we do? Do we have a hope that Allah will forgive me one day? Yes. You have a hope when you go to Hajj. And your intention of Hajj is not a vacation. It's not because your husband said you must go, or your wife said you must go, or your father said, or your neighbor said, or you feel embarrassed that you are 50 years old and you have not been to Hajj, so you must go. It's not because of that. Neither it is for shopping. For only one goal. Sayrun ilallah. Journey to your Lord. To seek forgiveness from Him. This is number one. We have done so many mistakes and wrongs. And sins. And therefore the only way to wash them away. Is to go to His house. There is a price we have to pay. You know when we have a violation on the freeway. Beside the money that we have to pay. $200, $300. They send us to traffic school. They say you must go. From 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. You sit in the class. So you always remember. Next time you don't speed. Allah says you want me. You want my forgiveness. You must come to me here. You must spend some time. You must spend from October 10th. Let's say. Until October 31st. You must come to my house. You can't stay with your wife and kids. Enjoying your time. And you say, oh God, forgive me. There is a price. And Allah is not selfish. He does not want you to go to his house for the sake of going to his house. He has a point. He says, when you come to my house, I am not going to benefit. I am not making money. Neither I am becoming more popular. Because you are coming. Because the number of the hujjaj is increasing. My popularity is not affected. Whether one people come to Hajj or 10 million people, Allah is the same God. Allahu Samad. This is one of the meanings of the verse that we recite. Qul huwa Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad. One of the meaning, one of the dimensions, tafasir of Allahu Samad, He's not affected like me. He's not a fluctuating one day up and one day down. He's not like that. We go for our own benefit. To redesign ourselves. We have to be redesigned. And Hajj is one of the ways. Not the only way. One of the ways of changing ourselves. Transforming ourselves. If we don't sleep in Arafat. If we don't sleep in Muzdalafah. On the dust. On the ground. If we don't sleep in Mina. In the tent. If we don't mingle with millions of people around us if we don't do the tawaf and the sa'i we would never if we don't throw, throw stones 
at the shaitan we cannot change ourselves we have to go through this process this is educational process with every step there is a philosophy some people understand the philosophy some people unfortunately they go to Hajj and they come back without gaining anything without understanding why they did this they don't even understand the meaning of tawaf tawaf has a meaning Allah is not wasting my time saying come and circumambulate seven times he has a point and I will speak about that inshallah why we do tawaf why we do sa'i why we throw stones at a piece of wall bricks does it have any significance? yes it does it does. It does. If we pay attention to it, it does. If we pay attention to it, it will change us. Tawaf will change me. The sa'i is going to change me. Everything I do in hajj is going to change me. But it all depends on me and my niyyah. This is why my friends, my brothers and sisters, from tonight, make the niyyah of ikhlas, sincerity with your Lord. That I am your guest. And you are my host. Period. Allah says, I am the host and I know how to take care of my guest. If, if a generous man, educated man, invites you to his house, would you be worried about what I am going to eat, how I am going to wash my hand, where I am going to... No. You say, he's edu he knows. He's experienced. He will take care of me. Allah is well experienced. He knows how to take care of us. Provided that we really go for him. Not for any other consideration. Not for any other consideration. Only for him. My goal is Allah. And this is what we're going to say in the beginning of Hajj. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik. It's easy for us to say labbaik. But our imams, Imam Zainul Abideen, when he was saying labbaik Allahumma labbaik, one of the people who was with him, Malik ibn, ibn Anas, the leader of the Maliki Madhab, he says his color changed, the color of his face, and he passed out and he fell down from, from the camel. He could not say, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik. Why? He can see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He know what he's saying. We like the children. Sometimes we say to the children, say this. He would say it without understanding. But our imams, they understand the meaning. They understand the position. Then they understand whom they are standing before. The same thing with Imam al-Sadiq. Before he said, Labbaik, he could not. He was out of a breath. Malik ibn Anas, he said to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, you have to say Labbaik. This is the beginning of the journey. If you don't say Labbaik now, you cannot begin the Hajj. Imam said, listen to the Imam's answer. This is Imam al-Sadiq, our sixth Imam. He said, أَخَافُ أَنْ يُقَالَ لِي لَا لَبَّيْكَ وَلَا سَعَدَيْكَ I am worried that if I say, Allahumma labbayk, I am coming to you, he would say, don't come to me. You are unwelcomed. This is our Imam, my friends. We have to learn from them. We have to learn from them. So if we go with ikhlas today, with a humility. With a humility. Today, my friends, we board the best airlines and we're going to go to the best hotels and the best food, believe me. First class group. But our Imams, they used to walk. Hassan and Hussein, alayhim as 25 times. 25 times. Their home was Medina. 25 times. They went from, to Hajj from Medina to Mecca walking. While they had horses and camels and, and money and they could ride the best ride, but they chose to go to their ma'shuq, to their sweetheart, which is Allah, walking on foot. As a gesture of humility, I really mean it, I am coming to you. I don't care, I get tired, exhausted, bleeding. I saw last Arba'in in, in, in Iraq, People who traveled 500 kilometers walking to the shrine of Imam Hussein. And they don't feel tired. And they like it. And they say, next year we will do the same. They don't get tired. If you, if you tell them, walk 500 kilometers, I'll give you $10,000. Maybe they say, it's not worth it. 500 kilometers to give me $10,000? They would not go. But to visit their sweetheart, 
it's worth it. We are going to the, the sweetest of the sweethearts. And this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So today from now, anything we do for hajj has to be with ikhlas, with sincerity. And you will see the reward. Definitely you will see the reward. My friends, inshallah when we, we are going to arrive into Medina, inshallah. And this is what most of the hujjaj do in hajj. We arrive in Medina and I think we stay four to five nights in Medina. In Medina, there are many things to do in Medina. The time is limited, only four days. Compared to Mecca, we're going to stay in Mecca probably 14 days. But in Medina, only four days or five days. The time is very limited. Medina is the capital of Islam. Medina is the cradle of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his family and his companions and all the Muslims. Islam started in Medina. Medina today, unfortunately, when you go to Medina, it has been modernized. New hotels, you know, streets and bridges. And, but in each corner in Medina, in each alleyway, in each street, there is a story of Islam. When Islam was being delivered and born in Medina. In each corner. So these are sacred places. Maybe some people don't pay attention to them. But in that area that you walk, it was the house of the Prophet and our Imams. They used to live in that quarter, in that neighborhood. Quran used to descend upon the Prophet in that area, in that vicinity. Either the masjid or outside the masjid. Medina at that time was very small. Today it is extended. But at that time, it was a very small, much, much smaller than the city of Irvine, let's say, much smaller, maybe uh, 2% of the city of Irvine. That was the size of Medina at that time. So we are going to go to a holy place. What do we do in Medina? And why do we go to Medina? Because some people say, I'm going to God, Hajj. I don't have time to go to Medina, and why should I go to Medina? And we had such people. Because there is a philosophy supporting them. There is a group of Muslims who do not believe in going to Medina. Contrary to what the Prophet himself said. The Prophet wasallam said, Man hajja wa lam yazurni faqad jafani. If you go to Hajj and you don't come to visit to me to say, Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah, you have did disservice to me. You neglected me. Jafani means you neglected me. And we should not neglect the Prophet. The Prophet is our Shafi'i intercessor. We need him tomorrow. We need him. On the Day of Judgment, we need his Shafa'a, his help, his push, to give us a push so we can go to paradise, inshallah. So this is why we go to Medina, to pay tribute and respect to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his family, his household. The Salat in Masjid al-Nabi Every prayer that you do inside Masjid al-Nabi is equal. One prayer, one prayer in Masjid al-Nabi is equal to how, how many prayers? Inside the Masjid. One prayer you do inside, inside the Masjid is equal to how many? 10,000 prayers outside the Masjid. The thawab, the reward of every prayers, every salat. And this is the hadith of the Prophet. As-salatu fi masjidi bi-asharati alafi salat. Inside his mosque, 10,000. And one prayer inside, inside Mecca, Masjid al-Haram, is equal to how many prayers outside Masjid al-Haram? Huh? 100,000 prayers. The thawab, the credit, the points you get is equal to 100,000. This is in Mecca, this is in Medina. This is Masjid al Nabi in Medina, this is Masjid al Haram in Mecca. The part of the yes, yeah, nowadays they consider the expansion 
which the masjid had been expanded many many times much larger than than the original masjid the scholars and the ulama they say the expansion is considered the hukm of the expansion is exactly the same like the hukm of the original masjid as if you are doing it in the original masjid and if you have salat that you missed in the past how many salat we missed during 40, 50, 60 years I don't know do the qada making up of the salat when you go there to Masjid Al-Nabi especially when after the, the daily prayers the daily and the nightly prayers after Fajr and Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Asha you will find plenty of room you can, people go back to their hotels to rest so if you can take advantage of that time to go and do qada whatever you have missed or you think you have missed in the past how do we do qada we start doing day by day we begin with salatul fajr to raka dhuhr for raka because you missed it not while you were traveling you were in town so even though you are traveling you may do the qada as four raka for dhuhr four for asr three for maghrib and four for isha if you have time the other things that we do in Masjid al-Nabi is the Quranic recitation. Don't forget to recite Quran. The dua and most importantly, Ziyarat al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. In this booklet, you will find the Ziyarat of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam with the transliteration and the translation, both. And in the Farsi books, you can see that a Farsi translation of it, the Urdu translation. So this is the original, the Arabic. This is a transliteration, and this is a translation, the meaning of the ziyara of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his daughter Fatima al Zahra, who are believed to be buried with him in her house, because the compound, the mosque of the Prophet, my friend. The mosque of the Prophet, imagine this is the masjid, Masjid al Nabi, okay? Here is the original masjid. This is the original masjid, here, okay? This part and that, the rest is the expansion. This is the original masjid. The rest is the expansion. And now even people pray outside, here, on this side, on this side, on that side. Not on this side, because this is before the Imam. So this is uh, a plaza here, big plaza. And the baqi' is here. You go to the baqi' on this side. This is the baqi' here. This is the original masjid. Fatima, to, the Prophet is buried here. Here. And this is the house of Ali and Fatima, alayhim salam Where Fatima, alayhim salam is believed to be buried in this place or in the baqi'. So sometimes people visit her here in Masjid al-Nabi and sometimes they go to the Baqi' and visit her in Baqi' too. So, the ziyarah, any time you go there, the adab of the ziyarah, the manners of zi ziyarah, is that you say, I do the ziyarah on my behalf and my parents, my family members, my brothers, my sisters, my friends, people who ask me, to do ziyara for them. Always remember them. You are not going to lose anything. And they are going to get full credit like you. Any person you mention his or her name. They are going to get the credit like you. So be generous there. You are not losing anything. You are doing only one ziyara. But at least rather than getting only the credit for yourself. They also can get the credit. Without erasing any points from you. You get full share. Always, my friends, when you do ziyara, whether at home, whether abroad, always say on behalf of others. So, we're going to be in the hotel. Our hotel is going to be on this side. See, this is south. This is south. Mecca is here. Mecca is here, okay? This is south. So, our hotel is going to be on this side. So most of the time we're going to use these entrances to the masjid. There are many, other, many entrances from all directions. 
but most of the time we use this one and there are special entrances for sisters and special ones for men in Medina they don't enter from the same gate in Mecca however you can enter mixed from gates that are mixed for men and women but in Medina they don't allow that so there are entrances only for women and entrances only for men but the good thing about it once you go the first time then you get used to it you are not going to get lost because the hotel is very close to the masjid and also there are signs in all languages so you don't get lost but first time we will go with you inshallah the first time to get you familiar with the masjid and the things inside the masjid this is the original masjid if you can find a spot to pray here of course this is equal with this with all parts of masjid but this is the rawdah rawdah the prophet said bayna qabri wa minbari rawdatun min riyad al jannah between my grave and my member member the pulpit where the prophet used to stand there and give the sermon rawdatun is a garden of the par- gardens of paradise rawdatun min riyad al jannah so if you can go there and pray there and sometimes beside the daily prayers that we do and beside the prayers that are qada where you make up for the past you may offer two rak'ah for your relatives two rak'ah for your father two rak'ah for your mother two rak'ah for your uncle for instance those who are dead and as well as those who are alive you can do two rak'ah on their behalf in Masjid al-Nabi. How do we do that? We, we say in, in the niyyah, we say I am doing two rak'ah qurbatan ilallah. But once you finish the prayers, you say, oh Allah, these two rak'ah are for my father or my mother or mention the people and the friends. There are other places in Medina. The second one in importance after Masjid al-Nabi is the baqi'ah. And there is a plaza, big plaza, separating the masjid from the baqiyah. You can walk. This plaza here, this area, which separates the masjid from the baqiyah. I need him to bring me another to erase. This area used to be called Mahallat Bani Hashim. The neighborhood of Bani Hashim. Who are Bani Hashim? Bani Hashim are the family of the Prophet. He is from Bani Hashim. And other Imams. They used to live here. The house of Imam Al-Baqir. The house of Imam Zain Al-Abidin. The house of Imam Al-Sadiq. They used to be here. But it was completely demolished. And today it's a big plaza. Where people walk here and they pray. So they go to the Baqi'ah. In, in the cemetery of Baqi'ah. We have four important Imams buried there. Beginning with Al-Imam Al-Hasan Al-Mushtaba. Imam Hassan, the son of Imam Amir Al-Mu'mineen. Then after him, Imam Ali ibn Al-Husayn Zain Al-Abideen. The son of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And then after him, the fifth Imam, Imam Muhammad Al-Baqir. And after him, his son, the sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far Al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wassalam. Those four Imams are buried there in Baqiya and there are other dignitaries parts of the family of the Prophet many of them are the family of the Prophet the wives of the Prophet are buried there the daughters three daughters of the Prophet are buried there the aunts of the Prophet are buried there Ummul Banin is buried there and many others Ibrahim the son of the Prophet so when we go there inshallah we will familiarize you with these names and we will remind you when we reach Medina, we would repeat this so you get refreshed. But women cannot go inside Baqi'ah. According to the law there, women are not allowed to go to Baqi'ah. And therefore they can do the ziyara from below, from downstairs. There are other sites in Medina, my friends, that we're going to visit and Medina is full of sites, historic sites, but many of them have been demolished. 
Many of them have been demolished. 80% of these religious monuments and sites that belong to the Prophet and his family and his companions and the events that took place in Medina have been demolished. Today you find uh, it was replaced by a huge mall or gas station or a restaurant or you know street or a bridge or you know tunnel or whatever. They removed it. I remember when I went to Hajj more than 40 years ago. There were many sites. We used to go and visit many homes, many places. They no longer exist. However, some of these sites, they survived. They could not demolish them. One of them is Masjid Quba. And there is an emphasis on visiting Masjid Quba. From among all these sites, Masjid Quba is the most important. Because the Prophet says, من تطهر في بيته شو ما دريت شو كار ميكوني دينجا معلومة شي من تطهر في بيته whoever takes wudu in his residence in our case in our hotel our hotel is our residence take wudu وأتى قبا وصلى فيه ركعتان and then he comes to visit مسجد قبا and performs two ركعة inside مسجد قبا كان له أجر عمره he would receive the ajr, the thawab of Umrah. So we will go to Masjid Quba, inshallah. Then we will go after that to Masjid Al-Qiblatayn, where the Qibla was changed. You know, for 17 months in the beginning of Islam, for 17 months, Muslims used to face Jerusalem, the south. See, I told you here it's Mecca to the south. This is, they used to face Jerusalem in the north. The opposite direction, 180 degrees opposite. Jerusalem is here, okay, in the north. So they used to face Jerusalem in their prayers as the Qibla. And then Allah changed the Qibla from Jerusalem into Mecca, from north to south. So we're going to visit that place where the Qibla was changed. While the Prophet was doing his prayers, Jibreel came and he turned him from the north Let's say this is the north, Jerusalem, all the way to, to the south. While he was doing Salatul Asr. He did not cut his prayers. He did not stop. While he was doing, part, part of the Salat was towards Jerusalem. The other part was towards Mecca. We will visit that place. Masjidul Qiblatayn. And then we're going to visit Uhud. The battlefield of Uhud. One of the greatest battles in Islam. The battle of Uhud. We're going to visit the battleground you will see mount uhud and you would see the grave of the martyrs shuhada of uhud 70 martyrs were killed on that day including the uncle of the prophet hamza hamza ibn abdul muttalib and you will enjoy your time in medina inshallah but the suggestion that i have to you as your friend and your brother is that Whenever you have time, go to Masjid al-Nabi. And when you stand before the Prophet, we believe in our aqidah, in our ideology, we believe the Prophet can hear you. Allah says they are not dead. They are with me. And they are not disconnected from you. Physically, we cannot see them physically. But their ruh, their spirit is a present. Not only them. Any ordinary pious person after death, his spirit can come to his neighborhood, his house, his masjid, to check it out, to see what people are doing. Allah will give permission to the ruh to travel, let alone Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when you go and say to him, As-salamu alayka ya Rasulullah, he would answer your salam. He would answer your, your salam and your greetings. And... <coughs> Therefore, any time you go there, speak to the Prophet. Tell him and ask Allah with the position, with the status of the Prophet, with the, with the, the respect and the honor that the Prophet he has, and also Fatima to Zahra salam, and also our Imams to solve your problems, the problems of the Muslims, your community, your parents, your family members, it's the time where you have to do dua. Always remember the dua. And make a list, my friends. 
I know before you're going to leave, many people are going to come to you and ask you for dua. They're going to say, please, pray for us. Please remember us. And there you're going to forget them. So do what I am doing for so many years. I put the names on a two or three pages like that. And when I go to Masjid al-Nabi, I take them out. And I start reading the names of the people and their families. So I don't forget them. Because sometimes I promise them, yes, I'll pray for you. And when I come back, he will come to me. Did you pray for me? And I cannot lie to him because I am just back from Hajj, you know. So uh, write them down on a piece of paper. Because you're going to use it in Medina, in Masjid al-Nabi, in Baqi', in Arafat, in Mina in Masjid al-Haram, many times. So this would facilitate this for you, make it easy for you, you remember all the names. Now, when we stay in Medina for four days, after that, on the first of the Hijjah, the first day of the Hijjah, we're going to go to Mecca. Hajj is made of two things. Hajj is made of Umrah, and then, plus what? Umrah and what? And Hajj. Umrah and Hajj. Umrah and Hajj. And this, this Umrah and Hajj is called what? Hajjul Tamattu. Because we have other types of Hajj. But they don't apply to us. They don't apply to us. There are three types of Hajj. What we do, people who don't live in Mecca or the vicinity of Mecca, they have to do Hajj al Because there are two other types, Hajj al-Ifrad wa Hajj al-Qiran. I don't want to confuse you about them. So just focus on this third type, our type, our duty, is Hajj al We are not doing Hajj al-Iqran, neither, neither Hajj al Ifrad. We are doing Hajj al And when we say Hajj al it has two parts, Umrah and Hajj. Umrah is a prelude, introduction into Hajj. And Umrah is much shorter and smaller than the Hajj. Umrah is three hours, four hours, Hajj is four days. This is the difference between them. And I'm going to explain to you. Next week we're going to have the PowerPoint here, inshallah, and we're going to explain the differences. So, what we must do now, uh, before we go to Mecca, the first thing we do, very first thing, we have to... The first thing, you have to prepare your ihram, my friends. I am going to show you the agar beistid khuba agar beistid. I am going to show you the men's ihram and inshallah the lady there is going to show you the sister's ihram. After the session she is going to show you the pieces there. So just pay attention to the not now later on. Yeah. This is the first piece. Can you wear this for me? And you can buy this from uh Okay, okay. So they give it to you free. They give it to you. So this is the first piece. This is how you wear it. No. All the way. All the way. Uh Uh-huh. So. This is how you wear it. And we're going to teach you this. Don't worry about it. We're going to teach you many, many times. We have plenty of time. But just to give you a rough idea. And this is... You have to have this. You have to have this. Hemian. Yeah. You have to buy this. Yeah, because sizes are different. MashaAllah, we are different in Shikam. So, you have to test it, try it before you buy it. And it has to be comfortable. And we really need this. One year, five or six years ago, a guy came with us and he said, I don't need it. And I knew why he didn't need it. He was very big, you know. He could not find the right size. All of a sudden, in Masjid al-Shajala, this one fell down. And you know, <laughs> it's a tragedy there. So you must wear this. You must wear this. And you can buy it from there, inshallah. And then you put this, you can put this over it. All right, you know. 
But you must buy this. This is the first. The second is the rida. So two pieces of ihram you're going to wear. And this is, uh huh, you bring it. Ahsant. That's it. This is, but then you don't wear anything underneath. Nothing. Nothing. Completely nothing. Completely nothing. Under, only, only one, two, and the himyan. And then you have to buy either from America something comfortable like this. You have to buy because we're going to walk. We're going to walk many kilometers there. So you must buy something comfortable. However, sisters, they can wear shoes. But we cannot wear shoes. It has to be open. It has to be open like this. So you have to buy something very comfortable from here if you can buy from here. Because I believe here is cheaper than there. And take it with you because we're going to walk for long distances. Okay, thank you so much. So then, uh, yeah, but it should not be, yes, it should not be made of leather or, uh, or the leather should be made in, a, in a Muslim countries. If this leather is made in a non-Muslim country, then it is problematic. Make sure that it is not made of leather. Or if you could not find here, then there, there are plenty of them. Prepare your ihram. We going to, and sisters also, they're going to explain to you later on, inshallah. The ihram, what you wear, prepare it from here. Take it with you from here. Um, because you might not find the right size for you there if you want to buy it there. Then, inshallah, we're going to do ghuslul ihram. The very first thing we do before we go to Umrah. So first, we're going to do this part, the Umrah. In Medina, in the hotel. Ghusl. What is ghusl, my friends? Ghusl is a shower that consists of three sections. First, you do the niyyah. Niyyah is the intention that you are doing ghusl of the ihram. Qurbatan ilallah ta'ala. And you, have, you can find it in this booklet. The niyyah is written in this book. But ghuslul ihram, my friends, has to be done in three steps. First, the head and the neck. This is with every religious shower. For men and women, these three steps has to be taken. Head and neck, and then the right side, front and back, and then the left side, front and back. This is the ghusl. This is the way we must do the religious ghusl. And then after that, once you do the ghusl, there is dua. You can read the dua. You can take this booklet with you and read the dua either before you do the ghusl or after you do it. Then you put on the ihram for men and women. But remember, men, only the ihram. But sisters, they're going to explain to them. Uh, they have different rules. They have more luxury than us in Hajj. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. And we wear the ihram. From there, we're going to be taken to Masjid al-Shajara. Masjid al-Shajara is outside Medina, my friends. But not very much outside. 15, 20 minutes a drive. It used to be outside. Nowadays, it's not outside. It's the suburb of Medina. And this is where the Prophet did his ihram. We don't do the ihram in the hotel. We just take the shower and we get dressed with the ihram. But we don't do the niyyah of ihram. Not yet. Where do we do the niyyah? In Masjid al-Shajara. We leave the hotel. They take us to Masjid al-Shajara. We go inside Masjid al-Shajara. Usually at 5 or 6 p.m. Just before sunset. Sunset would be 6.30, p.m. Or 7 p.m. maybe. And then we will do the Maghrib and Isha prayers. And then we're going to do the, the what? Niyyah. Very good. For men and women. But women are separated from us. They go from a different door. I'm going to do the Niyyah for you there, inshallah. Before you go inside the masjid. Or after you do the, your prayers and you come outside. 
We do the niyyah of ihram for what? What are we doing here? Not hajj. No, 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 no. Remember, we said what? We said we are doing umrah now. So we are doing ihram for umrah to tamattu'. Not hajj al tamattu'. Forget about hajj al tamattu'. Now it is umrah. One week later, when we are in Mecca, we're going to do another ihram, another ghusl, another ihram for hajj al tamattu'. And then we go to Arafat. But now we are in Medina. We are not in Mecca yet. We have to do the umrah first. So we do the ihram of umrah al tamattu'. Remember, ihram of umrah al tamattu', and you can find the niyyah here in this booklet. Umrah al tamattu', qurbatan ila Allah ta'ala. Immediately, once we do the niyyah, what should we do after it? Immediately, talbiyah, which is what? You will see it on the, you, you have it in this booklet. And we're going to put it on the board next month, uh, next week, inshallah. You're going to see it. لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك إن الحمد والنعمة لك والملك لا شريك لك لبيك. لبيك means here I am. When someone calls you, hey Ali Muhammad, what do you say to him? What do you say to him? Today we say yes, for instance. But the, in the Arabic literature, in the past, they used to say labbaik. Mean, means what? Do you, what do you want from me? Or I'm answering you. Yes. It means yes. Simply, it means yes. Labbaik means yes, God. Did he call on us? Yes, he did. When? I didn't hear him. Allah said 4,000 years ago. When we built the house, Ibrahim alayhi salam when he built the house Allah said to him Ibrahim now you go to Mount Abu Qubais which no longer exists unfortunately you will see the royal compound of Al Saud they built several huge buildings for the royal family and their guests huge compound huge maybe 20 buildings huge buildings tall buildings they removed the mountain and they built this so this used to be Jabal mountain, famous mountain in Mecca, Abu Qubais. Allah said to Ibrahim, now stand here in this desert. Nobody was there, only him and his son, two people, population of two. And وَأَذَّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا وَعَلَى كُلِّ ضَامِرٍ يَأْتِينَ مِنْ كُلِّ فَجٍ عَمِيرٍ Raise your voice, أَذَّنْ أَذَان, when you raise your voice, Call the people to come to my house. Ibrahim said, My Lord, nobody is here. Who's going to hear my voice? Allah said to him, Ya Ibrahim, you do your business and I'll do my business. Your job is to raise your voice. My job is to make sure that this voice will get to all the souls, even the unborn. So we received the invitation before our birth 4,000 years ago. Now, after 4,000 years ago, you, you come and you say, لبيك اللهم لبيك. Here I am. I got the invitation and I am answering you. We really have to think about this. This is very powerful, my friend. And this is serious. This is not fiction. What I am telling you is not fiction. It's in the Quran. It's in the Quran. So, you have to appreciate that you are so lucky that among how many Billions we have. How many millions of Muslims we have. Allah has chosen you to go to his house. He found you worthy, my friends. Don't put favor on God that, listen, I am spending $8,000 leaving my wife and my business. Don't do that. Look at it in a very reasonable way that Allah found you worthy. He could have disinvited you and he would invite others. But he found you this year worthy to go to his house. You have to be the happiest person. I know my friends. I know many people. Wallahi. That they've been trying to go to Hajj. But they did not get the invitation. Because Hajj is only by invitation. Only. Nobody can creep himself in and go to Hajj. Qachaq. There is no Qachaq in Hajj. Because Allah is the one who grants the visa. 
The real visa, it's not given by this government or that government. The real visa for Hajj, the real invitation is from him. Many people, they did so many things to go to Hajj. Allah said, I am not inviting you. He has a reason. And many others, two weeks before Hajj, all of a sudden, two weeks, they didn't even plan for it. All of a sudden, this means that it is only by invitation. So you have to cherish this. You have to value this. That Allah has found you worthy this year to invite you to his house. Then inshallah after that when we say labbaik Allahumma labbaik I'm going to say about it next week. I don't want to bombard you with, with, with uh, instructions. But two things before we conclude tonight. And then I will open the floor if you have uh, questions or remarks or comments. Feel free to tell me. One of the things, my friends, that we have to go to Hajj. Hajj, the day of Arafat, is the grand day of forgiveness. No opportunity in this life can rival and be equal to the day of Arafat. And the essence of Hajj, my friends, the essence of Hajj is Arafat. If you miss anything in Hajj, you can substitute that. But if you miss Arafat, there is no substitution. Nothing. You have to come next year. And the Prophet says, Al-Hajj Arafah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Meaning the essence of Hajj, the value of Hajj is in Arafat. Why it's in Arafat? Why Arafat is so important? Arafat is just a desert, just like any desert. Just like the Death Valley here. So why Arafat is really important and why we have to spend uh, the night before and the whole day almost 24 hours in that desert. I will explain that in Hajj inshallah. But just to, to tell you briefly about the importance of Arafat. Arafat is the day of grand forgiveness. No opportunity Allah will give us like Arafat. Even Laylatul Qadr. Laylatul Qadr, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Laylatul Qadr khayrun min alfi shahr. It's very important. Laylatul Qadr, it's better than 84 years. Alf shahr, 1,000 months, it's equal to 84 years. But still, Arafat is more important. Because Laylatul Qadr, it's one night you are sitting here in this mosque, another mosque in your house, wherever, and raising your hand, sitting in the comfort of your family and your residence, wearing the same dress, and there is air conditioning and light and food and a drink and khurma. Everything is available. And you say, oh God, forgive me. But Arafat is different. Arafat, you are not wearing this normal dress. You are in ihram. Arafat, you are renouncing the dunya. It's not in the comfort of your hotel. See, you know how much it cost us for the hotel per night? A room? Maybe a room in Mecca would cost a thousand dollars? Maybe a thousand dollars. We are leaving these rooms for four nights. Sleeping in the desert. Does it make sense? Someone would say, doesn't make sense. I'm leaving a room. I'm paying a thousand dollars to this room. A thousand dollars, four thousand dollars I'm losing. Sleeping in the desert? Yes, it is worth it. This is why we are in Hajj. Because of Arafat. Because Allah says, no more the comfort of the room and the mattress. I want you to be like others. Three million people, they sleep on the floor. Sleeping bag. Sometimes we are not ready to share the room with anyone. But in Arafat you must. With 300 people in the same tent. This is a humility. And my friends, if we don't go through this, we would not learn and we would not change and Allah would not forgive we have to go through this we have to crush the ego we have to crush the arrogance we have to crush the takabbur we have to crush that I am better than that I have more money I am more educated I am fulan I am fulan you have to crush it in, in Arafat this is why it's important we must go to Arafat if you don't experience this you come back empty handed you have not done anything. So prepare yourself, my friends. For Arafat, we have to prepare ourselves. 
Think about it. Keep it in your mind. Reflect on it. Always reflect that I'm leaving my, the comfort of my house. Here I have a good house, good car, good food. You know, my bathroom is clean. My bed is clean. But in Arafat, it's a different story. Allah says, I want you to be different today. I want you to bring yourself down today. For me. Not for anyone else. For him. For Allah. We have to bring ourselves down. So, we're going to speak about that. Since it is the day of forgiveness, what we must do here? We have to go to people here that we lived with them. And if we think that we did injustice to them, financial injustice, moral injustice, verbal injustice, physical injustice, we tell them, please forgive me. Yani halal talabi. To forgive me, to release me from my captivity. Because sin is captivity, my friends. We don't see it now. Sins, they handcuff us. But we don't see it now. We will see it later on. When they put us in the grave, we realize that these sins that I did, it's a captivity for me. Handcuffed me. So how do I open it? With what key? When I go to him and him and him, I say, listen, maybe one day I was unaware. I was ignorant. I was arrogant. I insulted you. I took this away from you. I took a loan from you. I didn't pay it back. I used your things, for instance, without your permission. Or in your absence, I did backbiting, ghiba, which is very dangerous. Ghiba is very dangerous. And it is mentioned in Surah Al-Hujurat, chapter 49. Ghiba is the worst sin that you destroy your friend from behind, backstabbing him. Not sometimes you say, say it in his face. He can defend himself. He can stand. He has a tongue. He says, no, you are wrong. He can contest you. But when he is absent, it's not good. Not good to accuse someone in his absence. This is not good. If he's there and you think he did something wrong, in his face. You tell him you did this to me. But not in his absence. This is going to destroy the human relationships. And my friends, we are humans. We are not animals. We are humans. Our life is based on love, compassion, respect, forgiveness, sharing, and helping one another. So now, my friends, before we go to Hajj, this is the tradition of ulama. Don't think you are the first one to do that. And don't say it is embarrassing. Believe me, when we stand before God, guilty, it's more embarrassing. It's more embarrassing. At that day, there is no return. At that day, the sinners are going to say, Rabbi Rji'oon, my Lord, take me back to this dunya. I can fix it. Allah says, where is the dunya? You passed. You passed. When you take a flight from here, transcontinental flight, from LAX going to London and once it's off the, 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 the runway can you go to the pilot say well I changed my mind please I want to go back home he says okay after 15 hours inshallah when we land in Heathrow go home you know too late for us it's too late there my friends Allah says listen you are coming to me I am very forgiving but it's not only my rights Sometimes you did wrong to others. Go and tell them about it. So you come to me with a clean record. Call the people. If you think that they have hukuk on you, certain rights, or you have taken some of their rights away, it could be physical. It could be physical. It could be physical. It could be sometimes not physical. You did not take money from them. But you, t you took respect from them. You accused them wrongly. Unjustly. This is even worse than taking $10,000 from them. In, in public you accused them of something that they d didn't do. They were innocent. Here you have to go and call them. This is do this before going to Hajj inshallah. 
two other things before I conclude. One is taqlid, my friends, the issue of taqlid in Islam, in the Shia tradition, school of Ahl al-Bayt. Mandatory that you follow a marja. Don't ask me who is the marja. I'm not going to answer you. You can ask your father, your mother, your uncle, you can call back home and say, many of you, you have marja, of course. Yeah, you have been following him. But if you have not heard about taqlid or marja, you are hearing about it for the first time, you have to investigate and you have to follow a marja. Why we have to follow a marja? Because we are not experts in Islamic law. Just like an attorney who, whose expertise in, in business law or immigration. Why do we go to him? Why we give him money? Why I cannot do it myself? Because I'm not an expert. It's not my business. So I need someone who's expert. The same thing with taqlid in religion. This ex expert spent 40, 50, 60 years studying. So we have to ask him the question. And he will give us the answer. And then the other issue is the issue of khums, my friends. Khums is zakat. Zakat, let me explain this to you. Zakat is the general term. The general term is alms giving. General term is zakat. Okay? Zakat. Zakat applies to so many things. One of them is gold and jewelry. If you have gold and jewelry, not that you wear, not that the women uh, use it as jewelry and they wear it as ornament, but they used to have it in big quantities where they trade with it. They trade. They use it as, as currency. In the past, they used to use gold and silver as currency. There were no notes, no coins. And if you have the cattle, for instance, Imagine a cowboy, he wants to go to Hajj. And he has, you know, Muslim cowboy. He has cattle, he has cows or sheep or, or uh, 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 camels. When they reach certain level, certain number, certain number, he has to pay one or two as zakat. Tax, taxation. Or wheat and barley. Or the food, dates, raisins, and other types of food. They have. But what is the zakat of the money? It's called khums. Why it is called khums? Why? Can you help me with that? Ahsant. Khums means one fifth. One over five. One over five. Which is equal to what? Twenty percent. Twenty percent of what, my friends? Let me make it easy for you. Because this is also a complicated issue. But I make it very, very easy. You make, let's say, let's say in America you make $80,000 a year, let's say. Okay? And you have a family. You have mortgage to pay. You have bills to pay. Let's say you, within this 12 months, over a period of 12 months, over this period, period of 12 months, you spent all of these 80,000. Nothing has remained. But you spend it legitimately. What do I mean? You spent it on food. Average food, drink, housing, gas, insurance, this and that. You did not spend this in Las Vegas. Some people, they spend 40,000 of it for their bills and another 40,000 in Las Vegas. This is legitimate, this is illegitimate. If you spend all the money legitimately, then you don't have to pay any taxes. Nothing. Zero balance. You, you got 80,000 through 12 months, and you spend the 80,000. But let's say you made 80,000 and you spend 70,000. So what is the surplus you have here? 10,000. 10,000 is the surplus that you made. Surplus. You did not spend. This is saving. You made a saving. The homes applies to this, to this 10,000. Not to that. Not to the capital. In the Mormon church, the taxation applies to the capital. Do you know that? And how much you have to pay? Do you know that? No clue? 
How much? Huh? 10% of the capital. Of the 80, which is the capital. In Islam, you pay 20% of the surplus. What is the 20% of this? 2,000 of the surplus money. This is what you have to do with your wealth. You have to choose a day, a date. Let's say the beginning of what month is this? This is Shawwal. In two days, we're going to have the Qada, the month of the Qada. So beginning of the Qada, you mark your calendar. You make the calculation. Now, sometimes you really cannot calculate exactly how much money you make. You don't know. Sometimes you receive from here or there. But you make a rough calculation of how much you made and how much you spent. And you come up with a number. And that number you pay the homes of it. Now, if you cannot, some people say, say it. Six years I have not paid homes. I have many properties now and many. You're asking me, I'm not going to go to Hajj. You know, believe me, I have many people when they hear about Khos, no, 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 Hajj, inshallah, in the Akhirah, we will do Hajj. All the ulama, they say, if you don't want to pay the khums of all your property, at least the khums of the Hajj, at least the money that you go with it to Hajj, is a purified money. And my friends, Allah says about zakat, this is in the Quran, in the Quran, Allah says about zakat, خُذْ مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ صَدَقَةً تُطَحِّرُهُمْ وَتُزَكِّيهِمْ بِهَا You purify them, you cleanse them. When you take this money from them and give it to the charities, give it to the Islamic, to the mosque, to an orphanage, to a hospital, to printing books, to disseminating Islam, supporting the scholars in the seminary who are going to support Islam, you are purifying them. تُطَحِّرُهُمْ وَتُزَكِّيهِمْ بِهَا why? Because we love money. Nobody says, I don't love money. Allah says, I want you to give me from the thing that you love. So if you love God, definitely you're going to give Him. Have you seen with some kids? Huh? With some kids? I've seen this. Give them ice cream and then tell them, can I have a bite? Some of them, they will say, sure, right away. Some, no, no. Now they took it from you. You purchased that for them. But they don't. They are reluctant. Others, they say, yes, sure. But reluctantly, of course. You, know, you can see that they are unhappy. But you know. Allah says, I have given you this. Give me some of it back to me. Give it back to me. Some of it, not all of it. You, you made 80,000. You made this. Uh, if you don't make surplus, no problem. But if you make some surplus saving, give me 2,000 of it. This is the story of Homs. So these are the things I wanted to tell you before we leave. But inshallah, the next things, the other thing is about wasiyah. I will touch upon that inshallah next Saturday. Are we going to have the lesson at 7.30, same time? So next Saturday, 7.30, but the Saturday after that, the 29th, we're going to have it from 3 to 5. Because we realize that we have a school here. And the school concludes at 3. So from 3 to 5, inshallah, the, not the next Saturday, the Saturday after that, the third lesson. So the second lesson is going to be 7.30, just like tonight. And the third Saturday is going to be from 3 to 5, inshallah. And we would remind you next week. وَصَلَّى وَسَلَّمَ عَلَى سَيِّدِنَا مُحَمَّدٍ وَأَهْلِ بَيْتِهَا الطَّيِّبِينَ الطَّاهِرِينَ